The following program is a Town of Colony television production of the William K. Sanford Town Library. Hello folks and welcome to a special program today. Uh, normally, if you watch, uh, if you watch this, this show on uh, public cable access, Time Warner Cable Access in Colony and Bethlehem, you see me on Young at Heart every month. It's a show about senior citizens. But today I'm going to do a very special program with a gentleman that I respect as one of the finest legislators in the New York State Legislature. He is our assemblyman from the 108th Assembly District. And uh, prior to that, he was a, uh, the mayor of the city of Cohoes. And my guest today is Senator John McDonald. Welcome. Hey, Tom, thank you, and it's good to be with you as well. And it's Assemblymember John McDonald, Remember. although I will tell you, on any given day, I'll be called a third of the population mayor, uh -huh. a third will call me Assemblymember, and a third will be Senator, oh. because of Roy McDonald, <laughs> who was oh, a good right. friend and served, and that's where that connection comes Did I say out. Senator? You did, did say Senator. Well, I gave you a promotion. I'm sorry. Well, I we, we'll see if it's a promotion or a demotion. <laughs> I don't think we'll it's see. a promotion, to be honest I don't know with if you. I'd go there, but we love That's being right. in the assembly, and it's great to be here. And you're in the majority, too. And we're in the majority. Which is which not is, a bad thing. It's a good thing. We are able to serve our constituents in a more effective way. And now my friend, who actually was a classmate of mine at Bishop Gibbons High School, Jimmy Tedesco, has gone from being in the minority in the assembly to being a senator in the majority over there. Only 33 years in purgatory, isn't it? Something? <laughs> That's right. Absolutely right. <laughs> John, there's something that I wanted to talk to you about about that uh, is um, it's, it's a problem that we're having more and more in uh, our communities around the Capital District, actually throughout the world. Mm -hmm. um, but I think especially we're rec recognizing it now in the United States. And I want to tap into your other profession, which right. is uh, that as a, as a pharmacist. Yes. And you're a graduate of Albany School of Pharmacy yep, yep. Union University. 1985. And uh, uh, and Maris Pharmacy, yep. your pharmacy in yep. in the city of Cohoes, a yep. great pharmacy, by the way. Yeah. And and that's opioid addiction. Yeah. And you know I <clears throat> I'm surprised because um, my full time job, actually my part time job now that I'm retired, is that of uh, uh, working for the Department for Aging. Mm -hmm. And I was surprised to find out how many members of our older American community are addicted to mm -hmm. opioids. Mm -hmm. What do you see as the problem? Well, let's step back just for a little bit to look at where this all started from. I go back to probably the mid-1980s when I was just a freshly minted uh, pharmacist. And I was very active in um, the Pharmacist Society of the State of New York in regards to the legislative affairs. So I remember at the time speaking before the legislature with one of the, the premier pain management doctors in the area talking about the problem back then that everybody wanted a solution to. And the problem was the fact that prescribers were afraid to prescribe opioids and patients were living a life of hell. Mm -hmm. They were living in excruciating pain. Mm -hmm. Well, we've gone from one end of the, folk, uh, the, the pendulum to the other. Now, when it happened over the last 10, 15 years, that prescribers and society, because the patients are part of that, became more familiar with hydrocodone and oxycodone. And candidly, I think many prescribers got comfortable prescribing them too much. Mm -hmm. um, and, and really, you know, the CDC wasn't putting any restrictions, wasn't giving any guidance to say you should only be using it for pain levels of eight, nine, or 10. And to be honest with you, the pain levels weren't even existing 15, 20 years ago. Right. So basically we have a, a, a generation that's grown up used to taking pain medication. We don't want to be in pain. It's not good. And it's kind of led people to live a life, particularly our seniors, uh, a life of, of, of regular drug use of drugs that potentially are dangerous. The challenge, which has led to the whole heroin, you know, the problem we have today is back in 2012, the state passed I stop, which was to put in more restrictions to allow physicians to really monitor their patients on their hydrocodone and oxycodone use, opioids we call it for mm -hmm. general. So we put restrictions on that, which basically started to slow down the market of prescribing of opioids. However, those who are addicted, 
went to the worst pharmacy possible. It's called the streets. Mm. Right, exactly. And the problem with heroin in the streets is unlike that oxycodone or hydrocodone tablet that you, you receive in the pharmacy, you know what you're getting each and every dose, right? Mm -hmm. uh, heroin's not like that. Heroin varies dramatically. Drug dealers are not licensed healthcare professionals, nor are they your friend. And they have no problem selling their product, and they'll do whatever they can do to keep their customer happy. So if it means super potent, super potent doses, they'll do that. If it means buying more bags, they'll do that. And sadly enough, what's gotten really dangerous now is that they are now cutting heroin to, to make more money by using a less expensive but more potent item called fentanyl. Fentanyl is extremely strong prescriptive opioid. I dispense it as a practicing pharmacist. It's very effective but not being used in the streets. And that's why we've seen a significant jump and increase in the amount of overdoses and deaths in not only the state of New York, but throughout this country. You would be interested to know they just released the CDC figures for deaths of heroin and opioid overdoses for 2015. Over 52,000 people have died of an overdose. It's tragic. It's absolutely tragic. I have a friend uh, who lives in Gilderland and his daughter, 21 years old, who had just competed and was going to be brought back for an audition for The Voice. Uh, beautiful young girl, yeah. wonderful talent, and had had uh, quite a, a problem with opioids from the time she was 13. Parents had sent her to all the best mm -hmm. of the, uh, I call them the, the um, um, the, the best of all of the yeah. rehabs throughout yeah. the you know yeah. the country club rehabs, yeah. and came home and, and was supposedly on the right path. But her mother got up one morning at four o'clock in the morning and saw that her light was on and opened the door and she had died of. And they found out after the toxicology reports came back that the the heroin that she had gotten was was laced was cut with uh, Xanax and fentanyl, yeah. which is a it's 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 a triple potion for death. Yeah, and it truly is. You know, and that's. Part of the challenge that's out there now, Xanax, which is a, a, an anxiety pill like Valium for those right. who are listening. What's one of the main side effects of that besides sedation? Is respiratory depression. Oh, okay. Respiratory depression of Xanax, respiratory depression of heroin, respiratory depression of fentanyl. It's no surprise, unfortunately, that she passed away, and it's tragic. And that, that story is being repeated time and time and time again. So, what are we doing about it? I think is the question. So this, last, this last legislative session. Um, you know, and I'm in, a, and I'm in a great position in some aspects with the legislature. Yeah, I'm in the majority, but more importantly, besides being one of a handful of business owners in both houses, uh, besides being one of only four former city mayors in both houses, I'm actually the only practicing health care professional in the legislature, mm -hmm. which is great for me and scary for the rest of us, mm -hmm. right? Because we should have more people who practice their professions contributing to the dialogue. Mm -hmm. Putting that aside, one of the large components of the heroin package that I pushed for, which is one of the second in the nation, is to limit the initial prescribing of a short acting opioid to a patient for acute pain. The tragic story we hear so often is high school student, whether it's the athlete, performer, whatever it may be, gets a knee injury, has some knee surgery, or has a dental extraction, and the prescriber back then gives them a bottle of 100 hydrocodone. Hey, get out of my sight, I don't want to see you, mm -hmm. you should be fine. And unfortunately, the child, because the parents don't know any better, they follow the doctor's orders, continue to take the medication. And most people don't realize this, within three days of being on regular hydrocodone or oxycodone, you can become addicted. Mm -hmm. These children become addicted, can't get any more pills from the doctor, they start stealing it from their grandmother, mm -hmm. start stealing it from their neighbor, their parents. And when that's all dried up, off to the streets they go. And that's when the irregularity and the unpredictability really rise to the surface. So the bill we passed requires, when, I, when, when Tom Scar first walks into a doctor, he can check the PMP registry. He know he can see if he's ever had it before or not. If he hasn't, we limit it to no more than a seven day supply. Honestly, I wanted five days. I could have made the argument for three days. Mm -hmm. Had a fair amount of pushback from the medical society. The governor didn't want to budge. So I said, you know what? 
sometimes the government, you got to compromise, and something is better than nothing. So we're starting off with seven days supply. And the good news is the CDC is finally starting to follow with some rulings. So that's one of the aspects. But, you know, Tom, the other bigger challenge we have is really getting society to look at drug addiction in a whole different light. And I've been using this example lately, and some people may find it offensive, and I hope it's not. But, you know, I, I was a, a college kid when uh, magic came down with AIDS. All right, okay. And people looked like AIDS is a, 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 a social, moral mm -hmm. failing. And that's how they looked at them, drug users, philanderers, whatever it may be. Um, in healthcare, we don't look at how a person contracts a disease. We don't judge a person by that. What we try to do is focus on making a person well, making mm -hmm. them live a healthy lifestyle. And we have to start looking at drug addiction no different than we look at diabetes, no different than we look at hypertension. It's a disease. Lord knows, and you've been uh, involved in public service for a long period of time, look at the challenges we've had in mental health. Right. You know, people used to say, oh, a person's mental, they're, they're crazy, they're right. nuts. No, they've got a disease. And we need to look at treating the disease and making sure that we remember the person in the process. I am disappointed at times when I hear from constituents or people from outside the region, because on this area particularly, people reach out to me from all over the state, and they'll say, how can you support somebody who uses drugs? And I said, well, do you know that 70%, this is not my statistics, these are, these are CDC statistics, 70% mm -hmm. of every heroin user started with a legally prescribed prescription. Right. So, you know, don't go casting a dispersion. Don't go casting a shadow of a person who's suffering with drug addiction. Let's focus on the fact that we need to educate. We need to help our sheriffs and, and all law enforcement with enforcement that's appropriate and, and legitimate. But we really need to be focusing on treatment, which is what we focused on in this last budget as well, mm -hmm. the last session. And we need to focus on recovery and, and, and encouraging people to live a life of recovery, to be proud of it. And now, to the governor's credit, the combat heroin commercials that are becoming more and more prevalent are giving examples of individuals, regardless of gender, creed, ethnicity, that are all living lives of recovery. They're living successful lives because we're treating them as individuals who have a disease, not individuals who have a social failing. What about prevention, Assemblyman uh, McGurk? Because I know that when uh, when cigarette smoke became, you yeah. know, became known yeah. as being a carcinogen, yeah. uh, we started a real heavy yeah. um, uh, educational component. Yeah. And it seems to, seems to have helped. And in, that effort is underway with combat heroin, but I think we can do better. And I'll give you a good example of a bill that's going to be one of my priorities this legislative session. Um, for those who may or may not know, if you go to the doctor and he wants to prescribe a controlled substance for you, they have to go into what's called the PMP, the Prescription Monitoring Program. New York State was one of the first in the nation, passed in 2012, and now it is almost universally throughout the country. Mm -hmm. Recently, we in New York State have joined a compact with the Northeast. So that way, you or I can't run over to the border and get drugs without the doctors knowing about it. Right. In that PMP, it'll tell me each and every time you've gotten, gotten a, an opioid filled at a farm, uh, that a doctor has prescribed one and where it was filled. Mm -hmm. So right then and there, you're having an honest conversation with the patient. What do you mean you never took this before? I see you got it at 12 different pharmacies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what I want to add to that PMP, and I realize it's going to come at a cost, but I think it's going to be worth saving lives. Whenever somebody is reversed with Narcan, the reversal agent right. that saves people's lives, whether reversed in the streets by our EMS providers, whether reversed in the hospital by our physicians and, and ER meds, whenever Narcan is administered, it has to be reported to the state. And it has to be reported in a timely manner, three to five days. Mm -hmm. What amazed me is a study done by um, Optum, which is United Healthcare, looked at a 12-year period out on the West Coast, I think it was the state of Washington, 90% of every person who was reversed with Narcan proceeded to, within days, if not weeks, walk back into their prescriber and get a prescription for an I'm opioid. Surprised. So let's make it the law of New York State and hopefully the law of the country that if you are reversed, Narcan's administered, that PMP has a flag that shows up and say, hey, Johnny actually almost lost his life on January 5th. Um, 
duck, that might be a signal not to cut them off. You don't, you know, we have to be practical. But it's one to We don't want to abandon people and put them in withdrawal. But basically, start to have that dialogue of saying, you know what, we've got a problem here, and your life is too valuable to be lost. Let's work on treatment and recovery. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is prevention in its purest form. What is the um, insurance companies? Yeah. Are the insurance companies willing to pay for longer stays in, in rehab, yeah. et cetera? One of the things that we passed in this last heroin package bill was a couple of good things. Uh, one, first of all, now patients can be held in hospitals if they come in under, under overdose or, or some kind of scenario like that. Before you could hold them for 48 hours, now they can be held for 72 hours. Mm -hmm. That was actually a struggle with a lot of our members. They felt that this might be a way to imprison people, but once again, it's to help people become in a greater state of mind mm -hmm. to be able to make a rational, rational thought. decision. Right. Now, if it's decided by the prescriber, physician, whoever it may be, that this patient needs help, they will be automatically allowed to go into a 14-day treatment program. Now, to be honest with you, most people think inpatient programs are the way to go. Mm -hmm. I love my Johnny. I want my son or my daughter back. The way you take them, I want them out of my sight for three months. And by the way, send them back to me the way I remember them. All right. Well, that's, that's the tall order to fill, to be honest with you. And we know there are many people that have been into, as you mentioned, that young girl from Gildland, that mm -hmm. have been in probably the best establishments throughout the country. The reality is it's not treatment is important. It's critical to try to rebalance life, get the person back in the frame of life of respecting themselves. But that's only the beginning. So yes, we've got 14 days. And by the way, on a parallel path, the care management team, mm -hmm. and it's a team now, it's not just one person, right. can now start making the petition to the plan saying, all right, you need to work with me. This person's going to need more than 14 days. So that has been very helpful um, in, in this whole process. The ability to make sure that when a patient first presents a prescription at any pharmacy for a drug for treatment, like Suboxone, to help them with this, that it can't just be put on prior approval, that they have to be allowed to get a seven-day supply, which gives the pharmacy and the doctor the opportunity to work through the insurance plan rules. Um, you know, people are funny. And I get it, but I work in healthcare on a daily basis still, one way or the other. Um, I think insurance companies are trying to quickly outpace lawyers as the most despised profession. And that's no disrespect, because I know many attorneys that are great. But the reality is that the insurance companies, whether you like them or not, mm -hmm. are charged with one responsibility, to balance the requirements that New York State and the federal government requires to be put into a package of health care benefits and to try to find an established provider panel that will meet those needs and to do it in a very cost-effective manner. And the problem is, in today's society, it's a good problem. We're living longer, but we're living with more challenges than ever before. Uh, just between diabetes and drug addiction alone, the costs of health care are going up dramatically. And that's not the fault of the individual. It's basically a, a, a result of the fact that people are living longer. They're not dying. And I have to realize there is a price for life. But then there's also the question, and now we go into yeah. a different area of the drug problem, and that's the uh, psychosocial uh, and, the, and the economic uh, uh, problems that we have. That you have a you have a child, and uh, you know one of my other jobs back in, in the day was as a, a therapist at a, a, a therapeutic community, drug and alcohol. I was there yeah. for about seven years, eight years, and I loved it uh, yeah. with adolescents. Take a kid out of a family that's sick, mm -hmm. you know, and it is a family disease in a lot of yes, a lot it of is. This. Sadly, it is. Bring a kid and you put him in a in a in a, in a place for maybe eighteen months. Gets well, he goes back into the sick family. The kid gets sick again. Yeah. You know, what do we do about that? I mean, what that's that's a real challenging situation um, because, and this is where sometimes we make the argument for outpatient care. Mm -hmm. You know, you be being within those four walls or being within that facility. You know, life is okay. Life is good. My stressors aren't there, but the reality is is that we have to also learn to live with our diseases. You know, you know patients with diabetes, they have to live with injecting themselves every day. To the average person, they're saying, I could never do that. 
Well, you have to make a decision in life of how you want to live your life, and that's how people with drug addiction have to look too. And in that same token, we need to provide the wraparound services. We need to make sure that there's the peer-to-peer -peer monitoring, which I do believe can be effective for those who want to participate. We need to make sure that the day treatment programs, we need to make sure that the methadone-assisted treatment facilities are available to the people. And you know, in all fairness, this is probably my biggest challenge representing five cities. I'm an urban legislature, and, 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 and that means the whole compendia of issues, as you know, uh, being an Albanian, of all the challenges that come with city life. And at the same token, uh, there are many people that don't want those facilities in their neighborhood. Right. And I always kind of, kind of pivot on the conversation. I said, you know, it's funny, I used to be a mayor, and when I meet with developers, and they would come in and say, I want to build a 20,000 square foot office building or a 15,000 square foot pharmacy in your community. What do you think? And even though I own a pharmacy, this is great, love to have you. Mm -hmm. If I came in and said in a different way, I want to do a 15,000 square foot drug house for treatment, you know, for inpatient in and out, we want no part of that. Now the, the, idea, the interesting component is arguably the treatment facility, you know, Liberty Medical, whatever it may be, probably dispense the same amount of methadone on a daily basis as I do in my pharmacy. Probably. So, so <laughs> what's the difference? Mm -hmm. What's the difference? The same patient can be walking into a pharmacy to get treatment, they could be walking into a facility to get treatment. I think this gets back to my whole aspect of looking at it as a disease and trying to bring that care model to place because if we don't, we're going to see failure and continued failure. And I think it makes sense for parents and grandparents, especially, that have a problem, uh, I don't want to say turning your, your child in or your, your, your loved one in, yeah. who obviously you, you begin to know at some point that they have a problem because you see that your pills are gone or, yeah. or your neighbor is saying, hey, Johnny was over at the house the other day and my wife's got 15 of her oxycodones missing. It's not turning them in, but it's getting them help. And how can they do that? With how can they how can they uh, get their, their their loved one help, and and hopefully not have them arrested? Well, the Good Samaritan law is in place now in New York State. It was passed probably four or five years ago, and this actually speaks to even past the parents. It's about the co-users. You and I are out one night. We're doing our heroin, and all of a sudden. How do I go? In, in the past, people would be afraid to call EMS, that person right. would die in the spot. Mm -hmm. Now, the co-users are protected from criminal charges okay. because of the Good Samaritan Law, which I think, once again, took a little bit of work and mindset changing, mm -hmm. but the reality is, is that you can't ignore the facts of life, that people are always going to look to protect themselves and not protect others. Now we allow that opportunity. But we really have to, your point gets into another larger discussion. Um, and, you know, first of all, none of us are exempt from this drug disease. Right. You and I could start hydrocodone tomorrow, and we could be just like anybody else. We're not exempt. And I think society needs to recognize that, that it doesn't matter if you come from the poorest neighborhood, the middle class, or the upper class. I remember... Uh, Senator Campana has been a longtime health commissioner. Um, in my first year, second year, we're walking the hallway. He says, you know, what are we going to do about this drug addiction? Now, he represents probably the toniest of all areas in Long Island. And he has families spending hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Mm -hmm. So it cuts across the socioeconomic barriers. It, it's not something that people are going to run and run around and flag and say, my, my Johnny's addicted. But same token, what we need to do is recognize that we can't be afraid to ask for help. And we have to make sure that that help is available. That's the responsibility that the state is embracing very seriously. As you know, uh, in years years of the county, the county is a very strong partner in that aspect. Mm -hmm. And we need to be talking about it not as a badge of honor, but more about how we're going to treat this disease. I've noticed a lot of times now in obituaries when somebody has died of uh, of addiction, it, it's actually mentioned in the, yeah. in the obituary they died of the disease of addiction. Absolutely. We need to share that message. And each and every case, and you know, here in the Capital Region, Times Union has done, I think, yeoman's work yeah. on really identifying real stories. You know, two days ago, there was a story on the front page, lower right-hand corner of the Times Union, talking about a, a young man 
and how he struggled for years. He had been in recovery for 16 months. The family actually was able to have a vacation. And to be honest with you, in that whole article, what I took up from that story is the family actually took a vacation together for the first time in several years. That speaks to how much drug addiction tears apart families. And listen, we all have them in our family. You know, my hope is that, you know, with when I look at my three children, who are wonderful, beautiful kids, mm -hmm. I have no guarantee that they're not going to go down that path. And it's not through the fault of my wife or myself or the lifestyle we lead. It's because of the fact that drugs take the person and you lose them. And you need to be very mindful of it at all times. Do you think there's a, uh, do, you see, do you see hope? In, in, in society? I do for this reason. We are openly talking about it. And I, once again, I, not to draw the parallel, but we talk about HIV and AIDS and thinking we never, ever see the end of the, and you know, see treatment for AIDS. And guess what? We are going to end the epidemic. This is going to be a little bit more challenging, but I think the more we openly talk about it, the more we man up or woman up, for lack of a better term, and, and, and address this head on, um, the more we give prescribers the tools, like I talked about with my legislation, mm -hmm. to be able to really identify situations where we see a person going down that road, I think we're getting there. And if we hit on all four um, aspects, I think it's important. We also have to cut down, and this is more at the federal level, um, this whole importing of, of fentanyl, which is dirt cheap, and it's coming from Mexico, it's coming from China. You know, personally, you know, people are very dubious about our new president. Personally, if one of his number one priorities is to have an immigration policy that can stand the test of time mm -hmm. and be legitimate and allow people to come here and, and enjoy the freedoms we enjoy in America, just like our ancestors did, I don't have a problem with that. Because quite honestly, we do need to protect our borders. We do need to cut down these cartels mm -hmm. importing these drugs. At the same token, we also need to really get the message to these drug dealers. Here in the capital region, I'm a co-sponsor in the Assembly. Senator Amador is a sponsor in the Senate of a bill called Larise Law. It's named after Patty Farrell's daughter, who used to work for the Albany County Sheriff's. Absolutely. And we want to hold drug dealers, when they sell drugs with the intention of overdosing people, to the, to the level of homicide. And now, you know, I'm not always the biggest fan of incarcerating everybody for everything. Right. I do believe people make mistakes in life. But I can tell you right now, drug dealers who day in and day out for their own personal profit, their own personal gain, are selling in an unregulated environment, dangerous drugs, mixing dangerous drugs. They've got no business being on the streets, and they have no business killing our children. Well, I've got to say, uh, as we draw this program to a close, uh, first of all, I want to thank you so much for coming on and uh, giving us a perspective from uh, the point of view of a professional, number one, as far as being a, a pharmacist and also as a public servant, somebody who has seen um, public service from uh, different levels yeah. of government, different levels of our society, and that we're very lucky in Albany County to have uh, somebody like you and your partner in every way, Assembly Member Pat Fahey. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, our County Executive, Dan yep, McCoy, absolutely. and our Sheriff, Greg Apple, yep. who is, you know, uh, trying to keep people out of the, the incarceration part yep. of this. Yep. That uh, that we have people, and, and especially, John, with you, um, to be, uh, are you the only pharmacist, right, in the in the Assembly? I'm the only health care professional, professional in the Senate and the Assembly. And, and it's amazing because yeah. this is a hot button issue right now. It sure is. And to have you uh, representing us and, and coming on this program and other programs that I've seen you to talk about the uh, the problem. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. I want to thank you for watching, and uh, I want to ask you to call or to uh, to come in and take a look at our program, Young at Heart. We are uh, we're on every month on uh, this very channel, and uh, maybe at some point we'll have John McDonald back, and we'll have Pat Fahey back to, to talk about some of the legislation that she's interested in up in the uh, state capitol. Thank you for watching.